Buddha Days on the 26th of May, celebration of the Enlightenment of the Buddha. We thought in the lead up to that we'd have a series of talks, and it's four weeks talking to people at the centre and the Sangha, sharing their experience of why they're a Buddhist. And to start us off, we have Dem here and Oliver. Yeah. Hi. So, um, yeah, Oliver's been coming for about eight months and um, his background in martial, art, martial arts. And um, it's been interesting seeing his engagement at the centre over the eight months. I'm very interested to see this stuff to talk about. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Apada. So, yeah, I've been coming along now for um, eight months. So, when um, Dan Tachita asked me to give this talk um, a few months back, it was quite interesting because I sort of. I sort of casually just said yes to it, and then I found, <laughs> I found for the sort of last sort of few months since I said yes to that, it's been the question's been sort of creeping into everything. Mm -hmm. So my meditation, or you know, when I've been out walking or whatever, and I'm um, trying to find sort of a, a a good answer or a sort of a narrative for for why. Um, so yeah, after after a lot of thinking, I've sort of put my thoughts down, and I'll, I'll try and I'll sort of try and go through my process, and um, yeah, hopefully. It makes a bit of sense. Um, so yeah, first I asked myself, um, a few weeks back I sort of started asking myself a few questions and um, I, I sort of pinned it down to what were my, what were my catalysts and what were my experiences that, um, that led to choosing this path? Um, what is it that Buddhism contains for me that appeals to me outside of my other interests? So when I think about things that motivate me or things that I have passions for, um, I can sort of narrow it down into three main categories, which would be um, my martial arts training, um, which is generally around Japanese, um, Japanese Budo. Um, Budo means um, Bu is warrior and Do is way, and I've trained with that since I was about sort of 17. Um, um, and I, yeah, I sort of trained that from about 17 th sort of through to 35, and that's always been very important to me. It's always been something that I've um, anchored off qu quite a lot. Um, then um, along with that, music would be another thing. So I've always been interested in music. Um, guitar and piano, I play a bit of both. And yeah, again, there's always been something running through that that's sort of been very important to me. And then nature, so I've always enjoyed hiking, climbing, these kinds of things. Um, so they were sort of the big three things that I sort of identified within myself where I sort of go to to seek something other than the norm. So something that I connect with that I can't quite put my finger on, but I've always been pulled to them. And I was asking myself, well, what is it that, what is it that I don't get out of those that I do get out of Buddhism? Or what is it that they have in common? And this is kind of what I use as my sort of starting point for, the, for this talk. So... Yeah, just in terms of my own timeline, um, things that are important, um, I sort of went back to my sort of, yeah, my childhood and thinking about the environment that I sort of grew up in. So I grew up in like the Midlands in the north of England and I sort of came out with some key words. Um, so it was a bit dull, my childhood. It was um, risk adverse, a um, bit oppressive, uh, low expectations, um, these are the kind of things that I associate with my sort of childhood and the, you know, that kind of oppressiveness of, you know, of the north of England where I grew up. And I always remember there was a, a real deep need or a real fear in me that I would end up there, like of those people that I was surrounded by. And there was always this anxiety and fear about um, getting out. And I think this is one of the initial things that sort of led me to take, take some sort of um, to risks. Um, and so from a, from a, a young age, I was always um, thinking of, I have, to, I have to get out of here. I have, to, I have to do something different. I have to think differently. And I remember like little things, like it started off with um, me going out cycling. I used to take my bike. I used to take it off into the Peak District when I was 14. And I just used to go for these really long bike rides, like 50 miles, 70 miles. I'd pick a place, I'd draw a map. And, um, and I'd cycle there and back, and it used to be a nice feeling because I used to think I was taking risks and I was getting out, I was doing something different to those people around me, and it made me feel a lot freer. Mm. Um, so that was one sort of little catalyst where I sort of at least got an idea of risk, adventure, that I can do other things. Um, 
Then another, I guess another important point for me would have been around 14 as well, 16. I was a bit sick. I, I got diagnosed with epilepsy at that point, and I started having... Um, when I think of catalysts for change at that age, at around sort of, yeah, 14, I started having seizures um, uh, every maybe three months, every six months. So there was a period of sort of going through different medications, trying to work out, um, yeah, trying to get a, a, a bit of control on this. And I remember, I remember this being quite a key point for me because it was a key time when I um, spent a lot of time uh, by myself reflecting, especially post having, um, post having seizures. I used to spend a lot of time in my bedroom and I'd have this, you know, I'd have, I'd have the seizure, I'd wake up, someone would be looking over me and I remember spending hours and hours just looking out the window or looking at the, the walls and reflecting on, um, yeah, you know, the normal things of, you know, why is this happening? But then also, well, what do I want to do with my life? What's the point in everything? Um, all those kind of big questions, I guess, that you start to ask yourself. So it's funny, I guess, in a way, when I think about things that enabled me to take risks or adventure, when I think about sickness and I think about, um, yeah, you know, having, having epilepsy and stuff, actually, that was a real catalyst for taking risks because compared to that, most of the things seemed quite trivial or quite um, easy. So, um, yeah, from a young age, I guess that was quite an important important time in terms of um, in terms of reflection um, along with that other influences for me would have been my grandmother um, my grandmother was sort of she was religious and she didn't speak very much about it but she used to write a lot of um, uh, poetry religious inspired poetry and I used to read some of that and some of it some of that I didn't understand but some of it really resonated and sunk in with me and I also remember <coughs> One thing that stuck in my head as a youngster is my grand saying to me, I remember her pulling me to one side and she, and I don't know what I was saying at the time or whether I was acting a bit silly or what I was doing. Maybe I was, maybe I was bullying my sister or whatever. But I remember her saying to me, love is the greatest gift you'll ever give. And she looked at me really intensely when she said that. And I remember it just being really um, humbling as she said it to me because it really like penetrated me and I just... I knew it was just the truth as she said it to me. And yeah, I just remember that having a, a really big impact on me because my gran didn't say a lot to me, but when she did, it really made an impact. And yeah, that was one of the big things anyway, I remember. And I also remember my gran being quite sad as I grew up, as I sort of went through this phase of uni and college and sort of told her I was, I was an atheist. Um, I, think it, I, I think I thought I was being a bit daring or fashionable at the time but I remember telling her I was an atheist and I just remember her being quite sad at that point yeah talking to me she sort of she sort of tried to explain to me faith and magic and if you get rid of faith then you close down all these possibilities and um, later on I've got, I mean I don't obviously I don't identify as an atheist anymore but um, yeah later on I, I, I sort of understood where she was coming from as well and um, not to be so flippant with my ideas I think um, yeah, anyway, so yeah, my gran had a big influence on me. And then um, training. So I got into Japanese martial arts. Um, and I think there's, um, there's, there's, a strong, um, there's a strong Zen sort of Buddhism element that runs through a lot of Japanese Budo and martial arts. Um, I trained a, a few different sort of um, Japanese traditions. Most of them were sort of based on different samurai lineages. Um, I trained EI or Iaido. Again, it's a it's another a Japanese martial art. I went to Japan a couple of times, and I always enjoyed I always enjoyed that um, that sort of Zen aspect, that sort of mindful aspect within martial arts. And um, I, I guess the longer I trained, um, I sort of found myself searching for um, other things as well, like um, in, in, instead of just the physical side of martial arts or the, the, the sort of technique side that was very important, I found myself very drawn to sort of uh, the mindfulness side of it. And I did then start to get into meditation through a friend who taught, he actually taught non-focal meditation and he trained with me. And he, he taught me a few basic techniques and I used to, I used to use those quite often um, myself at home. Um, 
Yeah, so I, kind of when I think about martial arts, I think about insight, insight through movement. And, the, you know, there's a lot of parallels that I draw. Like there's a lot of talk about form and formlessness in martial arts. And first you, first you learn form and you learn a way to move. And then as time goes on, it's, it's, it's all full of contradictions. Then you, lose, you, you learn to lose that form. You learn a certain amount of, um, you learn not to grasp at things. You learn not to be attached to things. And there's a, there's a lot of easy to understand, I guess, parallels in martial arts because it's physical. So when you're grasping something, you're physically grasping it. And I remember many exercises that we did, especially with um, beginners, where you would do something as simple as you would you'd tell them to hold you, um, to hold onto your lapel of your jacket or your gi or something. And you would, you would sort of, um, you know, you would step. You would just move to a particular position from where you were. And the person would always hold on to you. And just by moving, they were off balance. And you, I remember you often saw this whole um, idea of a person being attached to something, even when it was to their own disadvantage. So, you know, you, you could move, you could pull them, and even though they were off balance, they wouldn't let go. And, and it's that kind of, I always appreciated through martial arts, that physical idea of attachment and grasping and you know, letting things go and letting things, um, changing with things as they developed naturally in a situation. So a lot of the martial arts I did with them, my teachers were used to just naturally throw in situations. You change partners, you change weapons, um, you, you change form, you change technique. You'd always add things in there that were unexpected and the idea was that you got used to not grasping and not being attached to things. And that was always very important to me as well. Um, and yeah, I think there's just a natural... Yeah, when I think about all those things I learned through Budo and Japanese martial arts, I just think there's a, such a natural flow into, into Buddhism for me. Um, it just seemed, um, it just seemed a, I guess, a natural step. I sort of came to a point with martial arts where I was sort of ready to... I was almost ready to sort of... Well, I was ready to give it up, but I also needed something else then. I... Um, I didn't find that need for sort of, I guess, learning through a physical means anymore. And Buddhism for me is now is kind of like, yeah, I don't know. It's like a, it, maybe it's a maturing or it's a moving on to a, a different way of learning. So it's insight, but through a different format. So it's not a, it's not sort of so much of a physical way to get to that insight. But now it's, you know, I have, um, I have meditation. I have the Sangha. I have the people around me that can provide input to me. And then I have the stories from the Buddha as well. So it's a nice... I feel like I have all the tools, and that's one of the main reasons I would say, well, why am I a Buddhist? Now I, think, I feel like I have a great tool set. And, um, yeah, I feel like I have a great tool set for insight into myself. And ultimately, that's what I, that's what I need, because, you know, over the years, especially over the last five to ten years, I've definitely, I've definitely seen myself in this... Um, you know, it's quite easy to see yourself in this, this circular repetition of looking for, looking for highs, looking for, um, you know, desiring things, whether it's your career, whether it's a sport, whatever it is, you, I've definitely, um, I've recognised that this, there's this kind of up and down, but you always settle back down to the same point. If this is kind of like how satisfied or peaceful I feel, and there's a line, then, you know, it's like, this is, this is desire, and it sort of goes up and you get something and it goes back down to this line again. And then, I, then something else replaces it. And that's the best way I've, I feel that it, of describing it. So the tool set for me of Buddhism is raising this, this line of insight up slowly and slowly and seeing slowly where, where that takes me. I don't know, how, how am I going for time? Another five minutes. Another five minutes, wow. Um, so I thought, I was reading the other day back in one of my old Iido books, and um, there was a particular a couple of paragraphs that I thought were quite, quite nice and quite inspiring. So I thought I might read these. So this is, um, this is a paragraph from a book on EI. Um, and this was, the, yeah, this was a Japanese martial art that I studied. And this was, one of the, this was one of the practitioners talking about it. So here he says, in the initial stage, every pra practitioner will be attached to the sword, having the desire to become strong and put all effort into learning the techniques and into controlling the movements of the body. 
Gradually, the student will forget about himself and pay more attention towards the imaginary opponent's actions because there is never actually a physical opponent in EI. In order to reach a technical level where one can respond automatically to the opponent's attack, in the stage beyond that, one will experience the power to create by oneself the situations on which the opponent will fix his mind and that make him want to attack. This is the level in which one controls the opponent mentally. From that moment, the practice of EI is no longer just for the acquisition of techniques, but also for the cultivation of one's mind to realize the bond between oneself and other people. By deepening that sense, the question is whether or not one will finally realize the feeling of unity with the air entering the lungs or brushing on the skin, or the light from the stars light years away reaching the eyes, or the sense of belonging to the plants and the herbs under one's feet, the animals, the pillars, the tatami, the space of the dojo, the building in which the dojo is located, the region, the country, the world, and finally the galaxy one is living in. The question is also whether or not one will develop a sense of belonging to the person or persons that are practicing next to oneself in the dojo and realize that to live together with them is a personal issue. One finally has to understand that it is very important to oneself to live in harmony with other people. Yeah, I just thought that was a nice, a nice extract um, from, um, yeah, from one of the EI teachers. Um, yeah, and um, I guess another thing that, another thing that sort of, um, that I was, um, that I was contemplating on whilst sort of thinking about um, writing something was, um, I also enjoy how, for me, the approach through Buddhism or through Buddha lies in um, discarding things as opposed to um, accumulating more things. So I don't really see my study now as being accumulating more and more information about Buddhism. I, I, um, I see it more as through my insight, through my study, I learn what else I can discard that's hindering me. And um, that's quite important for me as well. Um, so finally, just to finish with, I thought I'd be a little bit courageous tonight. And um, this is a poem I wrote um, when I was, I think I was about 28 or 30, and it was after a particular training session where I'm sure you, I'm sure you guys can all relate to one of those meditation sessions that you've had where you've sort of gone to a place and you feel very satisfied. And the same thing happens or happened to me, um, you know, now and again with my Buddha practice as well. And I remember one particular time I was training behind Parliament House in the gardens there with my instructor, just the two of us on a weekend. And I had one of these sessions which everything seemed to be going right. Um, there was none of that feeling of grasping. And I, anyway, afterwards, I just felt a compulsion to have to write something down. And that rarely happens to me. But I wrote this down. So I'll, um, so I'll read it for you. Um, so it's called A Warrior's Heart. So, sweet as a blossom, as hard as a thorn, to represent nothing, leave the choice to be born. As a stream finds its way, no thought of its path, where change has no plan, no haste for the last. Like a leaf finds its bed, no thought of its fall, its journey set out, as nature would call. To see no beginning, nor expect it to end, to ride life's flow round every last bend. No resenting our charity or need of reward, to walk a straight line just in our cause. No excuse in the many, a step not in part, this is the courage to know a warrior's heart. That's me. Beautiful. Cool. <laughs>